So in this final module, I'd like to reflect on what realism can and cannot tell us about relations between Russia and the West in the post-Cold War world, especially in light of the war that broke out in Ukraine following the Russian invasion in late February 2022. Now, one quite common way of interpreting Russia's behavior in invading Ukraine is to see the Russian leader, Vladimir Putin, um, as some kind of an aggressive dictator, perhaps as an dicta a dictator who is obsessed with past glories, with restoring Russia's glorious imperial past as he might see it. Note, however, that this really is not a realist perspective. Despite the fact that realists focus on power and conflict as recurrent features of international relations, the realist picture is of one in which states are insecure and hence seek to defend themselves. The realist picture is not of a world full of megalomaniac dictators seeking to expand their spheres of influence. The realist picture is of states which are fearful, they are uncertain, they know that no one else is going to defend them, defend them. no one else can be relied upon to defend them, and so that they pursue power for defensive purposes. And realists, to the extent that there is a sort of realist view on Russia in relation to Ukraine, realists have tended to try and interpret Russian behavior in this way. Rather than viewing Putin as some kind of megalomaniac dictator, realists have tended to highlight the ways in which Russia's behavior might be understood as defensive. So just to go back a bit, a kind of famous neorealist, John Mearsheimer wrote a, I think, deliberately provocative article in 2014 called Why the Ukraine Crisis is the West's Fault. Now, the time at which he was writing in 2014, Russia had recently annexed Crimea. Crimea. Russia had also intervened in eastern Ukraine, giving rise to the conflict, conflict in the Donbass region in the east of the country. And in suggesting that maybe in some way this crisis was the West's fault, what he was doing was to point out that it was dangerous for the West to risk antagonizing Russia by expanding NATO and the EU eastwards. So the idea was that to the extent that the West was kind of expanding eastwards and incorporating countries like Ukraine into its orbit, that would be experienced as threatening by a country like Russia. And of course, if Russia interpreted the West as threatening it, it was likely to respond defensively. So from this perspective, Russian intervention in Ukraine in 2014, annexing Crimea, intervening in the east of the country, could be understood as aimed at preventing the Ukraine from joining NATO, from joining the EU. And in that way can be understood as a form of balancing behavior. This is an attempt to balance against a threatening West by keeping Ukraine in Russia's orbit, in Russia's sphere of influence. Now, in my view, it would be going much too far to suggest that the war which broke out in February 2022 was in any way the West's fault. Clearly, it was Vladimir Putin who decided to invade, and clearly he should be held responsible for the war, including, of course, the, the, the various many awful atrocities that have been carried out by Russia in the course of that war. But I think it's worth emphasizing, I think realists wouldn't be surprised by the war. You know, the idea that a great power such as Russia, which feels threatened, will respond by defending or even trying to increase its sphere of influence is very much in line with realist expectations. Once again, however, and this is a theme which recurs across the various modules, I don't think realism tells us the whole story. I think if we want to understand why it is that relations between Russia and the West have increasingly become conflictual, characterized by tension in the post-Cold War world, we also have to pay attention to questions of identity, to why Russia might feel threatened. And I think that's not just about the power of the West, but is also about identity. In his many speeches, Vladimir Putin, the Russian president, has consistently emphasized the distinctiveness of Russian culture, and also what he views as the degeneracy of 
liberal values in the West. From his point of view, Russia is engaged in a kind of civilizational struggle to defend Russian culture and values against the threat of liberal values taking over the world. Now, this is an aspect of the tension, the conflict between Russia and the West, which, which realists, again, have a hard time making sense of. For realists, it's all about power, right? It's all about Russia defending itself against Western power. But there was a period during the early post-Cold War world where Russia didn't seem so threatened by Western power. I think what has emerged is, is something of a cultural or civilizational struggle. So in other words, in order to understand the conflict, the tension between Russia and the West in the post-Cold War world, my view is that we need to look at identity as well as power. You know, realism really does identify one very important bit of the puzzle, but it doesn't give us the whole picture. And this, I would suggest, is just true of realism more broadly. I think the right way of thinking about the relationship between theory and history in relation to realism is that realism distills one lesson of history, one really important lesson of history, which is that in an anarchic world, states have no option but to try and provide for their security. And this means that one of the things that states are going to be motivated by is the acquisition of power, the ability to defend themselves. And it's a really important lesson. But it's just not the only lesson of history. Another equally important lesson of history is that ideology, culture, identity also matter. And that ultimately this is what drives tensions and conflict between states just as much as questions of raw power. And that of course is the aspect of international relations which liberals, constructivists and others emphasise. And it's the aspect of international relations which they argue that realists miss. So maybe in the end, this is why we have competing theories of international relations. We have competing theories because what they do is try and distill certain key lessons of history. But actually, history offers up a range of lessons. History tells us that power is important, that in an anarchic international system, states need to defend itself, defend themselves. History also tells us that culture, identity, ideology, domestic politics really matter and often drive the kinds of tensions between states that can result in wars. So this means that while theories such as realism can be really useful guides to contemporary developments, can provide a really useful basis for trying to make predictions about the future, I think we should take them with a pinch of salt, or at least I think we should be really careful about taking one theory in isolation and supposing that it gives us the whole picture. We have competing theories in international relations and we really need them because in a sense they each give us part of the picture.